All right. Thank you, thank you. Whew. Hey, everybody, I want to welcome you to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live. You all know this show. This is where I sit down with the world's top humans, the most amazing people in the world, whether they're creators, entrepreneurs, or thought leaders, and I do everything I can to unpack their brains with the goal of helping you all and you at home to live your dreams, whether that's in career, in hobby, or in life. My guest today is one of the top financial experts on the planet, which is a big deal, and he is the best-selling author of Count 'em. One, two, three, four, five, nine New York Times bestselling books. We're gonna talk a lot this morning about his personal journey. Uh, we're gonna talk about, uh, of course, some personal finance, especially for creators and entrepreneurs, and spend some time talking about his new book, The Latte Factor. My guest is the one and only, the inimitable Mr. David Bach Ooh. in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Long time coming. Thank Please. you. Please. So excited to be here with you. Well, and this is a special episode because we're doing this kind of conversation before you kick into a class. So if you're That's watching right. from anywhere on the planet, you get to hear us talk, and then you're going to go into a, a We're going to teach the Latte Factor Masterclass today. And, and, and give this guy a round of applause because we are... <laughs> We are doing what, this is a pre-launch. This yeah. book is actually out next week. So you're seeing it here yeah. first. This comes out on Tuesday. You can pre-order it now. But, you know, I reached out to you and said, let's teach the class on this. Yeah. And you guys have been such huge uh, supporters and such an amazing partner. We've had oh. 32,000 people go through <laughs> our last class. Start late, finish rich. Um, create live, you guys are just awesome. Thank so, you. Dude, th dude Appreciate thank, it. thank you. And welcome. Thank you. It's good to yes, be here. And it's cool to be here in studio because last time was in San Francisco. Yeah, how so, about it, right? It's um, nice. This is yeah, the home. This is, this, is where it all, this is where it all started. And speaking of where it all started, yeah. I want to go back to where it all started for you. So take me back. Try, we all see on Oprah and you know on the New York Times lists. But let's go back because I think everybody at home, those of us in the in-studio audience, when we see on Oprah, we, like, we can't really connect with our own experiences and then ending up where you have ended up, both right. rich and famous. Uh, but talk to me about the very, very beginning because um, I understand you, you came from a humble beginning. So give us the story. Yeah, well, so I started off investing at a really young age. How eight? How early? Seven. <laughs> and, and, which is just completely bizarre, totally. right? But here's, here's the thing. I was obsessed with money as a kid. So I, when I would go and visit my grandmother, all I wanted to do was play Monopoly. It was my favorite game in the whole world. And my parents hated playing with me because I would always win. So when I would go visit my grandmother in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, she would do whatever I wanted and I wanted to play Monopoly. So at seven years old, the other thing she would do that my parents wouldn't do, my parents are very mean. No, I'm kidding. I would want to go to McDonald's. So my grandma would go, you want to go to McDonald's? Well, go to McDonald's, right? We could go to McDonald's twice a day even. It was amazing. Whoa. So seven years old, I'm at McDonald's and my grandmother says to me, she leans forward and she says, you know, David, I'm going to teach you how to play Monopoly today for real. I go, what do you mean? She says, well, you love to play the game of money. How about I teach you how to play money for real? So she, she taught me a lesson at seven. This is not my seven-year-old experience. She, <laughs> she, she taught me a lesson at seven that, by the way, all of you can teach your kids. You can teach yourself. Because at seven, I got it. She said at seven, and she's like, there's three types of people in the world, and I'm going to explain it to you right now. The person right now who's working at the cash register has a job. That job pays minimum wage. At the time, I think it was like 85 cents an hour. Literally, that was what minimum wage was. She said, it's a very hard way to make a living. And I feel for those people. You should always appreciate them because they work so hard. But it's tough to build wealth that way. She said, the second type of person is somebody like you who comes here and eats and spends money. You're called, you're called a consumer. And everybody does that. And then the third type of person is the person who gets rich. There's a person who actually owns McDonald's. And she said, if you own McDonald's, you can become very wealthy. I'm like, Grandma, how would I own McDonald's? So she <laughs> says, like, well. I've got a plan. I'm going to have so many she Big said, Macs. She's like, I'm going to teach you. So we went home, and she took out the Wall Street Journal. I'm, remember, I'm seven. But she opens up the Wall Street Journal. She's, she circles MCD. For those of you who don't know, MCD to this day is still the, the stock ticker symbol for McDonald's. 
she said, now I'm going to teach. So she showed me the price, but that price was yesterday. So she said, that was yesterday's price. Now I'm going to teach you how to know what today's price is. This is before the internet. So she brings me into the family room, puts me in front of a TV screen, and teaches me how to read a, to a stock ticker symbol. And she says, every time you see MCD go by, call out the price. That's the price at that moment. She says, tomorrow I'm going to take you down to, to a stock brokerage firm and we'll buy you a share of McDonald's and you will own this place. Every time you come here now, you'll make money from yourself. <laughs> Every time your friends come here, you'll make money. This is how people in America get rich. And my grandmother at 30 was poor. She was, didn't have a college education, sold wigs at Gimbel's department store, wow. and through investing became a self-made millionaire over her lifetime. Wow. Passed those lessons on to me, my father, my sister. We, my family's now been in the financial service industry for 50, de 50 years. 50 decades. 50 yeah. decades. I was like, that would be 50 years. 50 years. And we had we a, invented yeah. money. <laughs> I, I wish. But it's funny because uh, two days ago I was in, in the Bay Area uh -huh. with my family. We did our first book event with my family and, and our, my family's clients and the, who I used to work with. Mm -hmm. And we had women, had two women in that event that were at my first Smart Women Finish Rich seminar that I taught in 1994. Wow. Wow, right? Because it, it was People just it was just a little ride, it yeah. was just a little class yeah. that I had a dream to go make bigger. And my dream was, as so many creators have dreams, yep. I had a dream that I wanted to teach a million women to be smarter with money. So they could do what my grandmother had done, protect themselves and teach their kids. And that's what led to the class, which led to Smart Women Finish Rich, my first book, which led to a PBS special which led to classes being taught all over America and then Canada. But it started in this little tiny class. And there were two women from that little tiny class. And one of those women, Lynn Hadley, later went on Oprah with me. <laughs> so it's, you know, I get chills when I tell yeah. these stories because, they're, first of all, they're all real stories. Yeah. Like, it actually happened. And we, like at this, at this event two days ago where there's all these people in the room, they're like, I was at that class in 1994. And it's like, wow, okay, time's really gone by fast, too, because yeah. that was 20, oh, what? How many years ago? That's 25 years ago. Do you credit your grandma to this day with helping you not just understand money, obviously, because that's a very profound lesson, but there's life lessons buried in that story as well? <laughs> Look at my... Yeah, I, yeah. Completely. I, first grandma. of all, I dedicated the first book to her. I wouldn't have written it if it wasn't for her. The automatic Millionaire? No, Smart oh, Women smart Finish Rich. Country. And what happened, this is the hard part to share right now, um, and it's in this book, The Latte Factor, what happened is that my grandmother... I was finishing the book. She was 86. My grandmother was super healthy. She outlived my grandfather by 15 years, like so many women do. She was drinking green juice every day and hiking five miles a day. She was dating wow. three men three nights a week. <laughs> we didn't know that until she passed away at the funeral. We found Read out. Read journal, grandma's um, journal. But Grandma Bach at 86 had a, had a stroke. And we brought her to a nursing care facility by, our, by where we lived. And I asked her, because I was finishing Smart Women Finish Rich. I said, I'm fi the book's dedicated to you. All your lessons are in here. Is there anything else I, I should share that you haven't taught me yet? And she said, no, I've taught you everything. And I go, well, do you have any regrets in life? And she said, no. And then the next day I came to the nursing care facility and I said, um, how'd you sleep? She said, terrible. I was up all night long thinking about my regrets. <laughs> and I was like, and, and then, and she was serious. And what happened is she went, she actually did think about her regrets. And then she went through them with me. Wow. And she went through five. And then she said, the lesson's not in these five regrets, Chase. She said, the lesson is, David, what happened was I came to a fork in the road. Where I had, and we all do. You all, we always come to forks in the road. There are transitions in life. And she said, I came to a fork in the road. And on one, one road, one journey, was where all the gold was. This was where I really wanted to go. This is where, you know, we would say we would call it a creator. I call it your soul. Yep. This is where your soul wants to go. And she said, every time, instead of taking that road, I took the safe road. And she said, what happened to me was I didn't listen to my little girl. She said, there was a little girl inside of me. She's like, it's, she's still here, by the way. But I'm 86, and I'm probably never going to leave this bed. I'm going to die here. And she said, but the little girl at the time, she wanted to come out and play. And I listened to my big girl. And she said, so I want you to listen to your little boy. Because you're going to come to these forks in the road. And I don't want you to be 86 
and go, what if? And she said, and tell other people this, because everybody's got them, all this beautiful audience. You've all got little girls inside of you and little boys inside. Well, we've got one boy here. <laughs> and, but, and, and, and at any age, yeah. there's these points. And we talked about this last night, but yeah. um, so I wanted to, I also wanted to weave that story. That's actually the core of this book. Yeah. The latte factor is, is, is about so much more than money. It's about making sure in life you, you listen to your soul, you listen to your dreams, and you take the risk for it. And I, I think, you know, in a way, even though the book's not out, I feel like I'm already so happy with what's happened because I have a 15-year-old, and he's never read any of my books. He wouldn't read them. They're stacked by his, <laughs> by his bed. But he's like a kid, right? right? So he wouldn't, and so... One of the reasons I wrote a story yep. that you can read in an hour was to take all these life lessons, unpack them, and put them in a little story that a 15-year-old would read. Well, he read this book cover to cover, and at the end of it, on a flight home from skiing, after two hours, he turned to me, and I said, what's, he goes, yeah, this is actually a really good book. <laughs> and, and, yes. and, and then I, and he, and I go, so what's the most important lesson you learned? And he said, your grandmother's lesson, that I need to take risk. And we're, we're getting ready to go. I'm going to tour across America for the next three months. And then we're picking up and moving to Florence, Italy for a year. Which is awesome. Which is, which is awesome, so right? awesome. And, it's, and it, it's, it's a scary thing to do to pick up and change your whole life. But I wanted my family to live abroad before I lose my kid. My kid's going to go to college in three years. And I wanted him to have that experience. And, but we made a decision to give him a choice. He had a choice to go to Florence, Italy. He could elect to stay at his school, which is scary as hell to give a 15-year-old a choice that big. Yeah. And he said, I, he chose, I wanna go. And the point is, after he read this book, he looked at me and he said, the lesson I learned is I need to take risk in life, and dad, if I hadn't made the decision to wanna go to Florence, that would have been one of my five biggest regrets in life. I would have looked back on this for the rest of my life someday and regretted this. And I just thought, okay, I just did my life's yeah, work, right? Check, because done, <laughs> done. Don't even need to go to Florence anymore, right? So, you got all the benefit, don't have to travel. But I mean, this is a lesson that we all need to be learning and reminding ourselves of what happens in the beginning of this book. The book's a, a main, the main character is a, one, is a woman named Zoe Daniels, and she's a 20-something millennial. And it starts by her taking the subway from Brooklyn into New York City, where we, I live, yep. downtown, and she's in the Oculus, uh, which those, is, yeah, that's a big. The Oculus uh, is a huge, massive, incredible four point six billion dollar development uh, above the Fulton subway station. It's the biggest subway station that connects everything in New York City. Right there at the the nine eleven memorial. Yeah, and right by the Freedom Tower. Yeah, and so she she's walking through the Oculus, which is underground. It's all marble. It's beautiful, and there's an LCD screen that's like a football field long, and on this LCD screen, what she sees is. If you don't know where you're going, you might not like where you end up. And she takes the escalator up above ground and she comes out right by her office, which she normally just rushes right into. Only today, in the beginning of the book, she looks at the 9-11 memorial and she sees people mourning. And she's, she's gone by the memorial for six years. And I walk by the memorial every single day. It's on my way to the office. Lots of people who live down there, you just walk. First time ever she takes it in, she sits down and she asks herself a question. What is she doing with her life? And that's what begins the journey for, for Zoe Daniels. And I started the book that way because at any age, I truly believe you need to be asking yourself, where are you going with your life? We, we just sort of assume we're gonna live forever and we're not. And you, too many of us don't live intentional based lives. We get caught in this like rat race. And how easy is it, right? You just, you, you stop thinking with intention, even for, not necessarily a day, but a week, a month, and you end up like, wait a minute, what am, what am I, I just had my fourth cup of coffee, why do I need to drink four cups of coffee? And it's, that's, it's something as small and simple as that, but that compounded can, like, you hugely off course accidentally without even trying. Both good and bad, right? Like, yeah. we, had this, we had a conversation yesterday, a couple friends and I, about a couple of my friends had gained a lot of weight. And a friend said, you know, I don't know how I ended up 100 pounds overweight. I knew you in college, you, you're the same size, I'm 100 pounds heavier. 
I go, dude, it wasn't that complicated. You gained three pounds a year for 30 years. You didn't gain 100 pounds in a, in a year. I, you know, and what's weird, he didn't, he's like, he's like I, don't, I don't know how all of a sudden I'm your age and I'm 100 pounds heavier than you. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, first of all, you know, you know that's what happened. Yeah. And, and it's, it's the same thing with money. Like the whole point of the latte factor is this incredible, true miracle of compound interest. And the miracle of compound interest, which should be taught in school and really isn't, yeah. is that miracle, the miracle of compound interest can work against you or for you. Like the credit card industry works against you. Borrow small amounts of money, it adds up, have a high interest rate, never get out of debt. Spend the rest of your life paying off debt for stuff you don't even need. The opposite of that is the miracle compound interest. Say 5, 10, 15, $20 a day, and you turn around 20, 30 years later, and you're rich. <laughs> and when you start in your 20s, yeah. like we have all these charts we'll show later today yeah. in this class, but when you start in your 20s, it's super easy. And there's a lot of people who go, well, 50, is it too late for me? And I go, no, it's never too late. You, just, you have to get started. Yeah. Small steps, baby steps, baby wins. When you get little tiny wins, those little tiny wins give you more confidence. I think that's, the, that's true in everything. I, you know, if a, a musical artist you love is all of a sudden everywhere, like you didn't know them yesterday, and now they're on every television show on the top of the charts, we have this belief that that just happened oh, overnight. Oh, right? lucky. But we understand through breaking all of these stories down and digging in, one of the things that I, I grew up reading artist biographies, and the same is true with these biographies as with the, the music example I'm giving and with the compound interest example, is that it's the classic 10, 20, 30 year overnight success. And I often reference a friend, Macklemore, who's from Seattle. He was like, oh my gosh, he came from zero to like everywhere. And he's like, yeah, he was making music in his parents' basement 15 years before you'd ever heard his name. And it, you're, putting, it, you're putting 10 bucks a day in your bank account that's going to pay off at some point. In the, in the book, Zoe Daniels has this, she doesn't believe she can pay herself first, right? Yeah. She's, she's, li- she's, like, she's like everybody in America. She's living paycheck to paycheck. She has worked in New York for six years. Her income's gone up a little bit each year, but so have her expenses. So she's six years in, but now she's six years more tired. Mm-hmm. And what happens, like, when, a lot of times when you start any career, you come, like, New York's a city of dreamers, right? So is Seattle now. Yeah. Lots of cities, right? You, you, go, you come to a place for your dreams. Yeah. And you're super energetic and you're super excited. And then six years later, she's super tired. <laughs> she's working 50 hours a yep. week. She hasn't got anything in the bank. And she's getting depressed. And she's asking herself, like so many millennials, she's still got student loans. Yep. She's renting a, a little tiny apartment with, a, with another fr- Like she's, she's just your classic millennial struggling. Yep. And she's asking herself, Am I, is there ever going to be a light at the end of the tunnel? And in the story, she meets some mentors, and one of her mentors says to her, you need to get financially selfish. And she's like, and she's been raised to not be selfish. And she goes, what do you mean? He's like, you need to to decide that the first person who's going to get paid when you earn a paycheck is you. Right now, you just pay everybody else. You pay taxes. You pay your house, you pay your landlord who's getting rich off your rent. Whole Foods. And he goes through the list of all the things that she pays, right? (laughs) And he's like, you have to get selfish and put yourself first. You have to pay yourself first. And he gives her, and you're going to all learn this in this class, but he gives her the formula that ordinary people in America have used to become millionaires. There's 42 million people now in the world that are millionaires. The bulk of them have used this formula. It is, we're going to give it to all you right now. Wow. It is like, all right. it, It is one hour a day of your income. So Zoe learns in this little book She's just got to save one hour a day of her income. And he like, asks her, well, how much do you make an hour? Because from 9 to 10, if you keep your first hour a day of your income, and I would say this to everybody who's behind this cameras here at Create Alive, yeah. it's your first hour a day of your income. It's, it's whatever you make from 9 to 10, you keep the first hour. When I did this on Oprah, and, that, and the show was over, it was the last show of the year. It was gonna, it was, we launched the Automatic Millionaire on her show. The next day, they called me from Harpo, and they said, if this show does for America what it just did at Harpo, um, this is going to be the biggest financial show we've ever done. And I go, why? What happened? They're like, you left the building, and 44 people signed up for their 401k plan. 
on the like like at like it was like the, uh, and like we didn't have a 401k sign up like everybody was watching you yeah. and then went down to their 401k down the human resource person and said I need to sign up for my 401k plan or I need to increase it to 1 hour yeah. a day because of your income because what most people do Chase is they save 15 minutes a day of their income when you look at the average savings rate in America which is about 4% yep that's like 15 to 20 minutes of your income so one hour a day is the math. So Zoe takes his math. It's thir- in her case, she makes $30 an hour. She plugs it into a calculator. We'll give you in the class the calculator to use. And she runs the numbers and up pops $4.1 million at retirement. Now she runs the, the numbers at 10%. But she, she's, her mind is blown away. She's like, $30 a day, one hour a day of my income. I'm going to have $4.1 million. And her friend's like, you can't get 10%. So she plugs in 7%, and the number is $1.7 million. Then she goes, okay, fine. Let's be super conservative and say it's just 5% of rate of return. It's 991000 And she kind of closes her laptop, and she's like, okay, well, even that's a lot of money. Because right now, she's, she's like, right now, right now I'm on track. I'm, I'm trying to pay my rent right. right now. But right now, she's like, I'm on track for zero. Yeah. And if I can save one hour a day of my income, I could change my whole life. And she goes back to work with a bounce in her step and a plan. And then she does these things. Go back to the message that she saw walking through the, the Oculus with, yeah. like, as soon as you can put yourself on a path. So, speaking of a path, I wanna go back to your personal story. Grandma gives you this wisdom at seven, which is, you know the number of grandmas that gave that to their <laughs> grandkids at seven? There's actually only seven of those kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did you do immediately with that knowledge? Because let's go to your your, your 15-year-old son right now. Yeah. Your 15-year-old son heard it when he was seven, because you're like, let me tell you a story. And he was seven, he was like, okay, great. Yep. And we just talked about the stack of books next to his desk. You got through to him with the latte factor. But at seven, something probably changed in you. What was it, when did this sort of, um, this vision, not just about saving money, but more about not having regrets in life and unleashing your inner child. Give me your art. Well, so if I, if I go to like the, that conversation, I didn't know she was going to die. That was my last conversation with her. I just thought she was going to get better. Yeah. You know, I was, I was young. I was like, yeah. oh, Grandma's she's gonna, she, you'll be out of here in a week. Yeah. You're fine. Yeah. She died. Yeah. That was my last conversation with her. When, when I left... And I drove back to my office. My office was in, is in it's, to this day, the Bach Group is still in Orinda, California. And under our, our, our office is a parking garage underground. And I drove into the parking garage. And I busted out crying. It's totally just, I'm not a crier, and here I am crying. I, I, I busted out, I just started sobbing. And I, I looked in the rearview mirror super dark, it was super early, and I looked in the rearview mirror and I said to myself, I'm going to get you out of here, David, in three years. I was a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley. I had a career that I had fought, worked so hard to accomplish so yeah. much and help, help my clients, but my soul, my crazy-ass soul, because it was cr- <laughs> wanted to go out and teach a million women to be smarter with money, and I knew I couldn't do all of that at Morgan Stanley. And I told myself, in three years, I'm going to get you to the point where you... I'm talking to myself here. I know it sounds bizarre, but I'm talking to myself because we all do. If you're checking right now, yes, you do. Um, I I told myself, sitting there in this car, in three years, I will get you out of here. And we will spend our... (laughs) We're going to spend our life teaching more people how to be smarter with their money. And I... It took four years. And four years from the date of that, I picked up on a wing and a prayer and moved to New York to go write The Automatic Millionaire. And, you know, same thing. I was a, I was a total 10-year overnight success story. Yeah. I tried to get on Oprah in 1994. I had four books out before The Automatic Millionaire came out. Uh, and I'd actually sold a million copies. I'd been on every single TV show, but people still didn't really know who I was. And then I launched The Automatic Millionaire on, on Oprah, which just skyrocketed things. Yeah. But the point was, um, my soul knew that I couldn't, 
had a hard time being in a corporate box. We, yeah. we, we talked about this yesterday, yes, too, we right? Did. Um, <laughs> Look at us. In my soul, I'm a creator and I'm an entrepreneur. Most people actually are. Most people are not designed to be in a box, and even if it's a beautiful box. Yeah. And so my soul was like, you've got to go, there's more for you to do. And you know, God bless my mother. I had the most amazing mom in the entire world. Um, I just posted a picture with her yesterday on Instagram. My mom, I told my mom, you know what, mom, I really want to go do this. And she looked at me and she said, son, spread your wings and fly. And that meant me leaving the Bay Area and moving to New York. I didn't know anybody in New York. Yeah. And on the, I was also working with my father. And I said to my mom, I know, but what are we going to do? What about dad? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, sounds she, so familiar. Right, right? I, go, I, I go, what about dad? And she goes, I'll take care of your father. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she did somehow. Um, but, you know, my dad was fine. But um, my parents, God bless them, they have given me so much love and unconditional support, and that's led to so much confidence. They didn't question any of the things I wanted to do. They were like, you want to do it, go for it. That's the biggest gift parents can give. And then they've cheered me on all the way. So true. Let's talk for a second. Not everyone has that. I know. So for those folks at home who don't have either both parents or any parents, or they don't have a cheerleader in one or both of those parents, which I think is more common than not. So let's say there's more than 50% of the people listening and watching. How do, you, how do you teach those people? Not about money, but again, to me, this is all about the life lesson. About yeah, li completely. About li listening to that inner person. When they're getting messages, as Zoe is in this book, and as we all are, that tell us what we're supposed to be like, what we should do, what we ought to be like, and when that conflicts with that inner child that you are encouraging us to pursue, what are some tools, what are some ideas, some thoughts that you can share that help people who didn't have that framework that you had with your mother? Such a great question. So in the old days, your network was all you knew, which often was just your family. Yeah. The, 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 the incredible thing about today is that you can go on your computer and your iPhone and have a whole new network. Like, this is a network. Yep. This is a, you, you have created an environment. You bring the, you know, thank you for including me in this list, but you, you know, the, the best minds together. Yep. And you can watch something like this for free. For free. And learn new lessons. And then decide, well, do I want to embed those in myself? And you can watch this and go, oh, that was great. And then you can also go back and rewatch it and rewatch it, and rewatch it, and take notes, and then go, okay, what do I need to do based on what that person just said? And then adopt those habits. And then find communities of people. There are, how many of you are in my insider group right now? Okay, what, one, two, three, four, five. So five people in this room yep. joined my insider team to launch this book. We have 1,600 people across the world that I sent an email out and said, hey, I'm gonna create this, this group to get people super motivated to learn these life lessons and I want to teach them to you first and then you can go teach them to other people. So you, I don't even know, anybody here know each other? But like no. we have now a Facebook group online that's a total community where people are supporting each other. By the way, they, you can all still join this. It's at thelattefactor.com. <laughs> so know, seen anybody who hasn't <laughs> joined yet, you can only join this insider team though in, for like the next few days because yeah. this is taking us through next week for the launching of the book. Sure. And we've got 1,600 people. The publisher said, oh, the biggest one we've ever seen is 300. We have 1,600 people now inside this team. By the way, part of it is they get a free access to the Start Late, Finish Rich class we created, <laughs> only for a few more days. Um, all you gotta do is buy one copy of the book. But the more important part is the community. Yeah. And what happens with these online communities, if, you get, if you're in a good community, yeah. is you see people like they're all helping each other. They're all cheering each other on. And it's really important to point this out. You can be in a positive community, you can be in a really toxic community because there's a lot of bad communities that people are on right now yeah. that are all about negativity. And if you watch negative news and then read negative stuff online and then are a part of negative communities, your life becomes toxic. Yeah. And so I think you have to be super conscious of are you surrounding yourself with 
dream makers or dream stealers. And they're always both around you. And there can be people, by the way, that you love that are actually dream stealers. And I know a lot of people just say, well, cut them out. I, I, it's not always easy to cut them out. It's hard to cut your parents out, for one. Or, but, you yeah. can, but you can stop dialing pain. And what's crazy is that what a lot of us do, and I, I've done this in the past myself, it's a super bad habit, is you get excited about something, and then the first person you take it to is the one that you know is going to say it's dumb. And, and even in, in the book, Zoe Daniels has the dream stealer friend. She knows he's kind of negative. And as soon as she's excited and motivated, she brings it to him. And then you know what he does? He yucks on her yum. This is what my kids you know, say, don't yuck on my yum, dad. He yucks on her yum. She's all excited about paying herself first, and he just starts going through all the reasons why it won't yep. work. And it derails her for a while. This happens all the time. We're, this is a community of creators. A lot of people who are creators have a dream to go create something. You were for one of the greatest photographers in the world. Um, there are people I'm sure who told you you couldn't be a photographer. How, how, what do you mean you want to be a photographer? Totally, it was crazy. They were like, you can't make Great. a living as a photographer. Right. Who are you to be a photographer? What do you know about photography? Right? That's a dream stealer. For sure. And at the time, I didn't know anything, and I got like so basically for I hadn't shared that that was a dream of mine. And when I started, it was so absurd because people had never seen me hold a camera up to my face, and I told them that I had this crazy dream of just traveling the world with my friends and my then girlfriend, now wife Kate, and taking pictures and getting paid for it. And that was complete fiction to nine out of every 10 people that I spoke to. Because it sounds insane, but, <laughs> but here same, th same thing being a guy, by the way, who wanted to write a book for women and money, who doesn't know how to write. <laughs> but you go back to you, for example, you had something in your soul yeah. that brought you this idea and I would go, well, it's not crazy at all because that idea came from a higher power. And really, that's the core underlying message of the latte factor is that if you can free yourself financially, you can actually listen to your yep, soul. Yep. And what I believe is that when you, when you have these things that are inside of you that you want to do, it's coming from a higher power. And that most people don't listen to their higher power, you know, God, whoever their higher power is, because they're so trapped day to day yep. that they can't listen to it. And so when somebody says to them, Chase, you can't go be a photographer. You should be a doctor. You should be a doctor. Uh, and you're like, but I want to be a photographer. Yeah. Then you're like, you know what I want to do? I want to create this amazing thing online where I bring people together and I teach these courses and teach millions of people. Chase, you can't do that. And then you did it. Yeah. But all along the way, still to this day, doesn't matter how successful you become, people will start telling you why you can't do what you want to do. Yeah. This book that you're holding in your hands for 10 years, my publisher didn't want it. Even though I had nine New York Times best-selling books out, even though I'd sold seven million copies, you, you, people think, oh, you reach a level of success and the doors stay open forever to your ideas. It does not work like that. <laughs> it doesn't work like that for entrepreneurs. You've raised a bunch of money to build yeah. this business. The more successful you become, the more people tell you why things won't work or they want to help your creative process. Hardest thing about being a creator is often if you become successful, other people start to... Either they want to keep you in a certain box, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. You should have just stayed a photographer. How dare you go start a company that does this? Yeah, same, <laughs> right? exact, same exact problem. Never, it never really goes away. There's always going to be, and if you don't have parents like you were raised with, David, like it's a real thing at every, uh, I'm sure Taylor Swift is hearing from somebody that she shouldn't go do that next music video that looks like that because she's putting her career online. If she does this, she breaks out of her box and goes a different direction, she's gonna lose this many fans and she's not gonna get the next record deal and she's like perpetual. So what's this, let's flip the script. Like you mentioned community. What are some other, like keep, keep, keep telling me this story about it's, how to, how to repair you need, this. Well, community, I think community is huge. You yeah. need to find your tribe. Yeah. You need to, even if it's just one or two people that you can go on this dream together with. So find those people. It's hard to do stuff in life alone. It can only be one person sometimes. But I will say this, the most important person you gotta listen to is you. Yeah, for sure. You gotta fire yourself up every single day and be totally clear on what you want. And, and also, you need to be clear on what you don't want. We're at the very end of this class today, I'm gonna give you the two tools that I use 
to be incredibly intentional about what I want and what I don't want. I have a yes now list and a not now list. And you know, everybody's got their to-do list. I need to know in life what I'm focused on, which is my yes now list. And then I need to be super clear that I can only have so many yeses. So everything else has to go on the not now list. And those of you who are in my insider group that showed up, for the, you, you've got these tools, and we're at the end of this class, we'll give these tools out. But the problem, you can only do so much. Yeah. And so you have to eliminate people that are toxic. You need to eliminate the things in life that you're wasting time on. You need to not minor and major, ma minor and major, you need major. to not major and minor things. Bingo. And then the last thing I'd say is this. We, we, we treat our lives like we're going to live forever. And we're not. And you're going to snap your fingers and be 10 years older and 20 years older and 30 years older and eventually dead. And we don't say this enough. And so you have, I think you have to take time and you have to chunk it. And, and what I would say to you is this, first of all, the next 10 years of your life are going to be the healthiest years of your life. I, there's all, you know, people come on and go, yeah. exponential technologies, I'm going to inject you and you're going to live to be 150. Yeah, guess what? Mo the, the people, men still die at age 78 in this country and women die at 82. The difference in quality of life in their 70s is, is significantly less than your 60s. I mean, I just came from an event where all these clients of ours are 70, 75, 80, 85. A lot of canes. My father's got a walker all of a sudden at 79. He can't travel. Stop treating your life like it's going to be this way forever. It's not. Take these next 10 years and realize they're the healthiest of your life. They're the most energy you're ever going to have. Now, if you're one of those rare people that can change that, fantastic. But for the most part, these next 10 years, huge. Run with them like it's a sprint. Then go, what if you only had three years left to live? And you can see everybody breathing differently. Yeah. But like if you only had three Wake years left, call. if you only had three years left to live, then how would you live? Because if you only have three years left to live, first of all, a lot of shit that seems to matter to you right now will not matter. <laughs> and if you've only got three years left to live and you got 36 more months to go, you're gonna live differently. And I, I, that's, I wrote Smart Women Finish Rich, my first book, 20 years ago, because I was driving across the Golden Gate Bridge and I had a thought to myself, which was, if I only have three years left to live, I have to write this book. I wrote this book because I was like, if I only have three years left to live, this is the last book I'm gonna write. And um, you know, going back to that creative process and getting out of a box, I've written 12 nonfiction books. Publisher didn't want me to write a storybook. I wrote a storybook because I know 98% of people will never read a personal financial book. Yeah. My 15 year old was never gonna read a personal financial book. It's a Trojan horse, you put the <laughs> But if I could in sneak it. it into you in a little story that you can read in an hour, <laughs> Um, you can learn all the same lessons, and I can translate it all over the world and reach people who, who need the message but normally wouldn't read a book on money. There are people right now who are saying, I don't, I don't have this community. I'm in a job that I don't like. I'm doing something. And, and don't beat yourself up for how you got there, right? We, we've all ended up in a position just sort of like, you know, that old thing. If you, if you are one degree off starting right now, that if you travel 10 miles, how far away are you gonna be if your destination? So all of us, and this is, no, nothing in life is a straight course. We talked about the 10-year overnight success. The same is true, you don't walk this path straight to, straight to your, your highest vision of yourself. We're all zigzagging. But if I'm translating yeah. what you're saying, you, you've got to have the, and this is why you do the, the you only have three years left test, is you have to make some decisions to change some things in your life that will put you, A, around the people who are positive and who orient you around your goals, the, the yes sayers. Tune into communities like this one here, your, your personal community, Creative yep. Live, the, the, your, your group, and seek out the wisdom because it is very different. As you said earlier, 10 years ago, even just 10 years ago, we didn't have access to the same people, the same ideas that we do now. So there's, this is like, a, I want to hammer on this because it's such a prescient point. It's incredible. It's incredible how much wisdom we have now today yeah. at our fingertips. Wisdom always existed, by the way, in libraries. Yeah. I spent a lot of time in libraries. The bulk of my books have been written in libraries. And I remember being young and thinking, it's incredible. You can go into a library. Still to this day, they're there. It's free. And there's all this wisdom in these books. You just yeah. have to pick it up. Open it up, yeah, read it. There's a lifetime worth of wisdom in every <laughs> book on the shelf. And you're like, wow, there's a million lifetimes. So, so the, the information's out there, 
but you have to use it. Yeah. Like, I'm not teaching anything that couldn't have been taught in middle school and high school. Should have been. Everything that I teach in money, yeah. it's super simple. It's timeless. Somebody said to me yesterday, you know, you've been saying the same thing for 25 years. I go, he goes, you know, it's still good stuff. I go, I know, because it's timeless, because yeah. it works. Um, so I just think, you know, ask yourself truly, what do you want? <laughs> like, just like Zoe saw, if you don't know where you're going, you might not like where you end up. Where do you want to go? As, I, as I'm getting ready to go to Florence, there, this is how the real world is. There are people that go, oh, look at him. Of course he can go to Florence. He's lucky. And they're bitter. There are people who go, man, that's amazing. Tell me how you did this. How did you, how did you plan to take a year off? Because they're interested. <laughs> because they want to do it. And they want to know how you did it. Yep. And then there's the people that are just super excited for you and they celebrate. And they'll go, I'll come visit you. And that's like, that's how life is. Like we, I had a friend um, who was my motivator. He went to Barcelona for a year. Great picked up his family, moved his three kids, young kids, gets to Barcelona. I say to my wife, let's go visit them. We're the first, fam we're the first family who shows up to visit them, like in the first 30 days. They always show up early because everybody's excited to see you in the beginning. <laughs> so, so we get there. We're the first family to visit. And I look at my wife. It's like five years ago. And I go, this is amazing. We have to do this. We have to do this. We didn't go, oh, look at them, they're so lucky. We, we, uh, this is amazing. We have to do this someday. How did you do it? And by the way, we didn't go do it the next day, but that planted the seed in us. And five years later, we're going to go do it. Part of this book, Zoe Daniels learns how to take sabbaticals. We all work too much. And he, well, we all work too much in America. Yeah. In America, we all work too much. In Europe, they just shut down for August. In Europe, they take five, six, seven, eight weeks off. In America, if you told people you're taking five, six, seven, eight weeks off, they're like, what do you do? Yeah. How, the, how rich are you? In Europe, they all live like this. Yeah. They, they don't live to work. They work to live. So, yeah. What's hard for you right now? I think when, when what I, our, our friend Brene Brown talks about gold-plated grit, which is you put this shine on all the hardest things in life. You tell a story in 10 seconds. Oh, that was really hard. I did this. And then, isn't it awesome now? So I think for to, to bring us back to where 99.9% .9 of the people who are listening, watching, they want to know that something's hard for you right now. Dude. Tell, tell us a story. It's all hard. <laughs> <laughs> I worked on, first of all, 10 years of, of a publisher not wanting this book. Finally... I decided to write this book without this publisher, without anybody else wanting it. I decided I would sit down with my co-author, John Mann. We've talked about this book for 10 years. He wrote a great book called The Go-Giver. I said, John, we're going to work on this book until I think it's perfect. I think it's perfect. You, you get to think it's perfect, too, but like we're literally not going to, we're not going to put a deadline on this book. We're just going to work on it, work on it, work on it, work on it. John was patient with me because this book has been rewritten painstakingly, sentence by sentence by sentence, over and over again. Yep. Finally, at two years, I go, it's there. Let's show it to my agent, then let's go shop it. Okay, that ends up being 10% of the work. <laughs> now, the 90% is I have to go get this book into the world. I have been working on the, the, the point of which we're here now for almost a year. I will take every dollar that I receive as an advance and spend more than that to get this book into the world. I have been working nonstop for six months on all of this. This stuff just doesn't just happen. Yeah. Then I will be on the road for two months, which is time away from my family. I have to balance. People balance. Balance is tough, right? Like, at the end of the day, it's still me. I'm here live. I've been on the road for 10 days. I'm going to go home for two. I'm going to do media for 10. And I'm going to be on the road for another six weeks. I'm going to go all over the country. And it looks super glamorous and you can tell like I'm super energized because I love this but guess who's doing the work who's yeah. doing the work it's me yeah. doing the work guess the, who's going to be starfished in their bed tonight the, just it, like it, oh know, my god so I'm so tired it looks because it's cool because yeah. we got lights and we're on camera and there'll be an awesome Instagram image and it is cool by the way because how freaking cool is this <laughs> but it's still work yeah. right like I, I also you know when I was on Oprah Oprah's did the work for 30 years, right? And I would watch her because when the camera would turn on, 
then she's on. When the camera was off, then she wasn't using the energy, right? It's like an athlete. Yep. The energy that it takes to be the person is a massive amount of energy. I mean, you and I have talked yep. about this. Mm-hmm. It's, but anything that you want to do, I was with Lewis Howes, right? The greatness. Sure. Yeah, dear friend. Of anything that you want to do that involves greatness takes great effort. Yeah. And it doesn't take great effort for like a little piece of time. It takes great effort for a sustained period of time. Yeah. And I think the, the thing that I thought was, well, eventually this will just all get easier. <laughs> the truth is it doesn't actually yeah. just get easier because the world's always changing and you got to evolve. And so fortunately, I've had a, a gift of passion and purpose where I've kept the sustained energy up. Um, and I've learned how to also recharge my batteries. You know, one We're going to take those two things separately. Passion and purpose, recharge batteries. Yeah. Let's go to passion and purpose. Well, again, I'll go back to it's a God-given thing, right? Like, I've had the passion and purpose to free people financially for 26 years. My favorite thing to do in the whole world is teach. Why, I'm so, why I love doing Create Live yep. is that there's a live audience. And I get to see when you're all getting it. When you're a teacher and you just talk to a camera... <laughs> It's the weirdest thing to me, even like when I do Facebook Live with you guys, right? Because I'm like, I'm talking to you, and I can't see you. <laughs> Hi, I can't see you. Yeah. But you, I can see. Yeah. You, as I'm saying, see, saying things, you're, I can see when you're getting it. I can see when you start to get teary-eyed. I can, I, I can tell when I'm reaching you. And it's in those moments where you realize you're reaching somebody that you're like, then I need to use that again. The latte factor was all about, I realized it was reaching people because I was in live audiences teaching, and they were getting it, like, God, I've got my latte, and I'm not saving $5 a day, or I've got my bottle of water, and I'm not saving $5 a day, or whatever it is, right? They were getting it. So I've had this passion and purpose to free people financially, not about the money, but because I just want you to go live your God-given gifts. And, and somewhere in your, in your past, right? Because that's what most people are like, I don't know how to find that thing. What brought you joy as a young person? Was it climbing trees? Maybe you become an arborist. For you, you are embedded. Your family was in the financial, your father in financial services for years. You got passionate about money. But here's, but here's the thing. Like, what I got passionate about was teaching. Yep. I remember teaching a class at a local adult school, one of these classes that started the Latte Factor. And I remember thinking, if I could make $100,000 a year just teaching, I was making mo- much more than that as a financial advisor. If I could just make $100,000 a year just teaching, that would be, uh, that'd be the greatest thing in the world. And eventually, I've been able to make a living just teaching. I didn't want to go be in an office working one-on-one with somebody as a client, as a financial advisor. Um, It was a great great career, but it wasn't a great career for me. My passion was teaching. So, and passions can change. Of course, this is a very important point. And so, I'm probably unusual that my passion has stayed the same. But I'm also, look, I'm being totally totally honest and transparent. Uh, I don't plan to write another financial book. And I, was, I woke up this morning thinking about this because so, I'm so excited to be here. And I'm like, if I'm still so excited, then why do, why do I want to... St- so I'm thinking about stopping. Why do I want to stop teaching about money? And there's another voice inside of me saying, David, you have another 10, 20 years. You need to do something new. Even though I've been doing this for 26 years and I feel like I'm at the top of my game, there's another voice now saying to me, you're not doing another financial book. I don't know what the next book is. But... So I'm having, it's hard, because the other part of me wants to go, oh, but you're good at this. The other part's saying, mm, time to listen to the next voice. I, I just came up with a whole idea of kids' books, a whole kids' series. We're Not about money. To, uh, we're going to go back to the seven-year-old, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so so, um, so that was about purpose. I think the one thing I say to anybody who's listening and you're, and you're like, how do I find my purpose? Think about what you really like to do. Yeah. If you had to do it yeah. every day. People always go, what would you do for free? Because I basically did this for free for 10 years. Um, you know, what would you do for free? And then how, because what happens a lot of times, if, you, if there's something you really love, eventually you get really good at it, and then it's no longer free because people pay you. I taught 700 classes for free before I got my first Just check. Just let that sink in for a second. First check. If each class was a day, that's 700 days of work to get 
to the place where someone paid you. That's not to like, all right, and now I'm done. That's where you start after 700 days. This is the sort of the secret and why I feel like that's why this show exists, to help people yeah. deconstruct. When you're stuck wherever you are, and we're all stuck in some way, that's why I ask, like, what's hard for you? And you're like, okay, there, here, these are the things. We all have hard things. And you're just realizing that you're capable of taking 700 steps toward the thing that you want. And that is not the finish line, that is the start. You're at home in bed and you have to get to the starting line and it's 700 steps away. Don't you think that it makes a lot of sense to, to when you get there to have that be the thing that you actually want to be doing? To me, this is the trip, right? That was such a golden nugget just then. <laughs> Because it's so true. You know, if you're going to do the work in anything for a decade, I, I once heard from Tony Robbins. This was a, a moment also that changed my life. I was at a Tony Robbins seminar, and he said, in a decade, you're going to be a decade older, either having maybe reached your dreams, because you tried, or just 10 years older. I just told you, like, about, think about your next 10 years. And I was like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Right, because I wasn't going for my dream. My dream was to write Smart Women Finish Rich. I'd had the dream for four years and wasn't working on it. The funny thing about dreams, if you don't work on them, they never come true. Mm -hmm. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? Like, they never come true. Yeah. So it, it, it requires work and it requires you to take action steps and then it requires you to get your ass off the ground every time you're knocked down and know that you're going to be knocked down. And you can be cheered. And then the thing is, there's moments where like it's working, it's working, and now all of a sudden you're the guy. And then guess what? Something happens, and you're no longer the guy. All of a sudden, you went from being the genius. You, you know, they say hero to zero. <laughs> Life is funny. You can go like this, and you're the hero. And the next thing you know, people love to take that hero down back to zero. And then a lot of people who go from hero to zero never recover. And then people who you tend to see who reach greatness get knocked down, come back. Get knocked down, come back. A lot of entrepreneurs, by the time you see a success, they're like, oh, wow, look what they did. Same thing, 10-year overnight success story. Yeah. You didn't see all the stuff in between. So we've, we heard from you about some things that were hard. Um, I have a very specific question. How did you get the latte factor in the Oxford Dictionary? <laughs> it's literally in there. How cool is that? That's crazy. <laughs> right? I'm thinking, like, what purpose, life mission, and I'm like, how did I get that in the Oxford Dictionary? Well, so, <laughs> this is so, so Oxford came to me. The, the, the city uh, or the school? The, the, <laughs> the people who wrote the Oxford Dictionary wow. said, we want to do a financial dictionary. Will you go through the dictionary and tell us what we've missed? Well, it sure seemed to me like the latte factor should be in the Oxford Dictionary. <laughs> um, but that's really, the Oxford, they, they, Oxford Dictionary came to me to both go through the dictionary, give, give great other parts that were missing and put it in. And we wrote a thing, originally it was 1,001 words you need to know, the Oxford Dictionary, financial words, which became the Finnish Rich Dictionary. So the Oxford people were like, the latte factor is genius, yeah. That should definitely go in the dictionary. So now, the ox, a lot of factors in the dictionary. <laughs> Nobody's ever asked me that question before. Good. Funny thing is there's another guru who tries to use the latte factor all the time. Uh -huh. And originally she said that it was her idea. And I'm like, but I had a trademark on it 20 years ago. So Take that. Yeah, take that. Get, you got a good idea, make sure you trademark it. <laughs> <laughs> there's two things embedded in that story. One is they came to you. I think most people who are at home or in the audience or me in my head right now, like, how many times that does... Um, or I think Scott Belsky said, an amazing idea rarely comes to you, this is, I'm paraphrasing, rarely comes to you in an email with the subject line, amazing idea. <laughs> and, and, and so, like, what you described is Oxford coming to you. And the reality is, if you're doing what you're doing well enough for long enough, that people will notice and they will knock on your door. But there's a really long time before that ever happens. Yeah. So talk to me for a second about some, some more stories about things that you've done. I heard that you dreamed the dream of writing this book for four years before you did it. Um, tell me a, a few others so the people at home can well, understand that you, you pitched Oprah's team, that you, you, you know, drug your ass to the office every day for 10 years, that you tell us a couple of those stories. 95% of what I've done in my career is because I went out 
and knocked on the door, including this. Yep. You didn't call me. I've called you before, but not for but, this. But how, the, but no, but, but no, how this came to be. Yep. It's a great example. I was with somebody else, Ramit Sethi, yep. who, you know, people would think, well, we're competitors, we shouldn't be friends. I'm friends with most other people in my space. Yeah. And he's an amazing guy. And I'm like, what are you excited about? I'm investing in these different companies. Oh, I'm, I'm an investor in Create Live. I just did a class one, it was amazing. Oh, would you introduce me to them? That's how I got connected with yep. Create Live. Yep. When this book was coming out, I think some, I, he might have even reconnected us. Um, so if you go through everything that we're doing, for example, with this book launch, it's me making the phone calls. Yep. Right, like we have a partnership with Brandless, this incredibly innovative direct-to-consumer company. They've raised $250 million from SoftBank. I am, when I saw Tina Sharkey launching that company, I immediately texted her, emailed her, whatever it was I did, because I knew her from AOL days, who I'd also called on to be the money coach for AOL when they were launching it. I said, Tina, you're launching this amazing company. I want to invest in it. Well, this week, uh, every book that's bought for the launch Brandless, I didn't even say, that's a great way to say this. Brandless, for every book that's bought from the lattefactor.com on our website, Brandless is going to feed one family across America with Feed America. Now, I, but I brought the idea to Tina. Like, yeah. guys, let's be involved in my book launch. Oh, I'm going to do a podcast. Tina, Brandless should sponsor the podcast. The pod, by the way, the podcast is live. So I went, did the podcast, went to Brandless, said, you guys sponsor the podcast. Then you guys should buy the books and give them to people next week who buy stuff at brandless.com. All those things, though, it wasn't like I just called Tina and said, hey, what do you think of this idea? You want to do it? And we had multiple meetings yeah. with their CMO. Um, this was multiple meetings. Yep. And I can go through. There, there's 20 things like this. You look at my tour. We're going to go across the country, across the U.S. Most of the events are live and they're free at thelattefactor.com. I'm going everywhere, Chicago, New York, LA, Arizona, on and on and on. Back, I'm ending in Seattle. You and I are definitely parting on yes. my last day. Yes. Um, all those cities I had to arrange. Yeah. I, had, I reached out personally to people I know, love, and respect. Part of my financial service company, I have a company that we started three years ago. We've raised $7 billion on our platform. We have 500 financial advisors. I handpicked the advisors in the cities I wanted to go to. Every one of them I had to reach out to personally and say, I want you to host me in your market. My friend from high school is in the back of the room, Gretchen. I hired her just to handhold those 10 people on those 10 cities. And I could give you 100 more of those. And they're like, wrap it up, because time's ending here. But the, the person who's done everything that you're going to see me do with this book launch. You started it. I started, I, and I'm doing it. Yeah. You and I were talking yesterday about this event, and I'm like, I'm on my phone going, guys, you've got to be promoting more what we're doing right now. I was in the green room 50, 20 minutes before we started, like, we need more emails out. We need more links out. Yep. We need it on Facebook. We need it on Twitter. We need it on Instagram. I have an entire team that's paid to do this, but I'm still in the green room, sending out texts, pushing Called on Called me it. out on Twitter this morning, didn't you? Called you out on Twitter this morning at 5.35? <laughs> and he's like, I'm up early. Are you up? Ready for this? I was like, you know, I'm laying in bed looking at my phone I'm like... Oh man, come on, okay, and I'm just back at you. But I think that this, this is a really important thing that people need to hear, is that how, you're, how many ever years are into your career, how many New York Times bestsellers, still knocking on doors. Still getting turned down, but more and more people, the more success, like success begins. Success, I've done right? the Today Show a hundred times. I have done seven books on the Today Show. They have not booked me yet for this book. Hello, Today's Show. Where are you people? Um, so again, you know, new people today yep. show, so it hasn't happened. Well, can, do we have time for one last yeah, story? We've cut off. Yeah, um, of course. I'm driving. When, opp good. when opportunities come your way, you, you, the thing is opportunities come across all your lives. You got to grab it then, right? Because a lot of times they're like... It doesn't come in an email. It's, awesome it's, it's, idea. it's coming by. And then you're like, well, I'm not sure, maybe. I'm not, you know, and then shh, it's gone. And a classic example of this is I had an opportunity to fly to Geneva and meet Paulo Coelho. Paulo Coelho wrote the book, The Alchemist. How many of you read The Alchemist out of curiosity? Okay. Amazing. Art. Only two hands, three hands have gone up. Uh, that book, I think, has sold almost 100 million copies now. It's one of the most famous worldwide books ever. Everybody should read The Alchemist. You should all write a note to read The Alchemist. It's in your dedication to the book, isn't it? So this book is dedicated to Paulo Coelho and Oprah Winfrey, and my wife, those three key people. And 
I went to go have, I told my wife, I'm going to go to Geneva. Like, this is like a last minute thing. I'm going to go to Geneva and go have dinner with Paulo Coelho. She's like, what? Who? I go, Paulo Coelho wrote The Alchemist. She's like, oh, I have that book. I'm like, did you read it? She's like, no. I'm like, it's a really good book. You're, you're, you're going to go to Geneva for dinner. Yeah, it's Paulo Coelho. So I get on a plane, I fly to Geneva. I don't know what this is going to be like. It's, we go to this little dinner for Paulo, and he's, we close this restaurant down. He's like a true rock star. And then he's like, do you want to get a drink? Yeah. We go to a bar. Turns out Paulo likes to stay out. So we're, we're at this bar. They're staying open for us. We're drinking wine. And it's getting late. It's like 2, 3 in the morning. And he's got a, his, his handler's with him. And she says, Paulo, we have to go home now. And he goes, okay, ho- hold on one second. And he looks at me and he goes, David, I must ask you a question. I wish I could do his accent. I have to practice it. She goes, I, I must ask you a question. What is the book that your soul desires to write that you have not written yet? And I go, well, Paulo, I want to write this little book that's like a story. Like how you've written these books? I want to write this little book that's a story that will teach people that they're richer than they think, that, that small amounts of money that can change their life and that they can free themselves to listen to their soul and go for their dreams. And I want it to translate all over the world like your books have. And he puts his hand on my arm, and he goes, then David, you must write this book. The wisdom. And he, right? The simplicity and the it's wisdom. Like, it's like Yoda, <laughs> only it's Paulo. <laughs> then you must write this book. And he says, and write now, this book you must. And now, and now I must go. And he gets up, and he leaves, and I'm with another buddy of mine, Brendan Burchard. And he's like, what did Paulo say? And I'm like, he said I should write this book, The Latte Factor. And we like stumble out of this bar and I'm on cloud nine and I'm like, I've got to write this book. And I've been thinking about this book for 10 years almost at this point. I get home, I'm totally jet lagged. My wife goes, well, what did Paulo say? I go, he said I should write this book. And she's like, I've been telling you this for 10 (laughs) years. You need to go to Geneva? I'm like, well, Paulo reconfirmed it's a good idea. Like, and, um, and that was, that really was a catalyst for me. And I talked, we didn't get to like recharging your batteries, but I was yeah. totally, you know, what happened to me is in 2012, I was totally burnt out. Yeah. I didn't know that I was totally burnt out. I didn't know what was wrong with me. And I think this is probably a good thing to close on is that the need to take care of yourself. Like I was getting up and still early. I was going to the gym. I was going to the Today Show. Um, I was doing my work, but I was no longer joyful. And I was tired. And I was 46, but I felt 50. And I, would, and I thought I was just getting older. And I went to the doctor, and I was like, I don't feel right. Like, I'm tired all the time. And I don't sleep well. So I'm tired, and I don't sleep well. So, you know, he's like, we'll, we'll do all your blood work, right? So they, did all, they ran all these tests on me. And he's like, yeah, you know, just, your blood work's fine. You, you, might, you might just be getting, you're getting older. <laughs> and truthfully, I think looking back on it, I was also like burnt out and depressed. Um, and I was in a business course to try to figure out how to 10 times my income, which I had done previously. Like I, I had, you know, they always say this 10x thing, right? I had already 25x'd. So I'm sitting in this class trying to figure out how to 10x my business. And I ran through what everything would look like if I 10 x my business. And then what would I do at the end of those 10 years? And I came to this realization, well, I would take a year off and I would enjoy my life. <laughs> the irony. The irony, right? Because so then I was like, God, that's a whole lot of work just to now to hopefully in 10 years be healthy and enjoy my life. And I came home. This is how life works. I came home from that class and my wife said to me, what do you want for your birthday? And I said to her, you want to know what I want for my birthday? I want a year off. She goes, this isn't bad. She, she like goes, well, what do you mean? I go, I don't want to work for a year. And she turns the light on. <laughs> <laughs> Metaphor and, and then real. She right? goes, what do you mean you don't want to work? I'm like, she said, you mean you don't want to write your book? I'm like, nope. She's like, well, what about the Today Show? I go, no. 
She's like, what about speeches? I go, no. She said, what about your company? I go, I, I, I don't want to work for a year. That's what I want for my birthday. I was kind of being flippant. She goes, well, what would you do? I hadn't thought about that. I go, how about if I did what you do? Like, I could wake up in the morning, take the kids to school. I could go to the gym. I could get lunch with my friends, run a couple errands, and I could pick them up. Looks like fun. She's like, you know, it's not as easy as you think. <laughs> but, like, I'm like... I want to try it. I'd like to try it. I'd like yeah. to try just be, stay home it's and be... Something different. I'd like to try and be home and be a dad. Which was scary as hell. So she said, well, can we afford for you to take a year off? No, she said, can we afford for us to take a year off? I said, I said yes, if we, cut, if, we, if we reduce our expenses, I can take a year off. She said, no, 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 I didn't say anything about you, us reducing our expenses. <laughs> <laughs> I married you for better, no, for better or stay the same. <laughs> um, she, she's, and she's kind of joking, but I go, yes, we can afford for me to take the year off. And then she, and I go, how long can we afford for we started running numbers, and she's like, then take a year off. So then all the things I started working on took eight months to plan that, and then I took 2013 intentionally off, and I called it a sabbatical. Six weeks into not working, I felt 15 years younger. I was sleeping 10 hours a day. I was waking up joyful. I was totally excited about life again. I, had, I started having all these new ideas, I'm walking down the street like a little kid, like almost like bouncing for no reason. And I'm like, oh my God, all I needed to do was take a break. Health. And, and, and I, a friend of mine, Ariana Huffington, yeah. wrote a book called Thrive. And she also did a book on sleeping. And we were together because we, we were both learning how to, also during this time I learned how to meditate. I do TM meditation. Same. Did you meditate this morning? I did. Uh, I meditated yesterday at four o'clock because like I needed the energy to see yep. you. It's like the, we meditate twice a day. So meditation, they say, you know, it recharges your battery. And I said, you know, actually it re, it's like putting a new battery inside of you. A sabbatical is like, I got a whole new battery. And so I've also, the reason the sabbatical is in the book is that I know that more of you need a break because you're burnt out and you don't know it. One of the reasons people have to retire is they're just exhausted. Yeah. And so I think if more people could take breaks throughout their life, you could have, if you could just take these breaks, you would be re-energized. I came back from my break, became the vice chairman of one of the largest financial service companies in America. I wrote four books now in 36 months. Updated Smart Women Finish Rich, Smart Couples Finish Rich, Start Late, no, Smart Couples, Automatic Millionaire Smart Women. Redesigned my seminars, launched them across America started a new company, which is AE Wealth Management, which is now the fa one of the fastest growing RIAs in America, and wrote this book. It is all because I took that break. Yep. So you learn to rest, not to quit. Learn, learn to rest, because rest leads to recovery. And the last funny story I'll tell you is, so here I am, I'm feeling amazing. And I'm, I'm like, God, I feel so much better. This was the miracle pill, just taking some time off. And I'm, and I'm walking my son, Jack, to school, because he was still at the age that he would let me walk him to school. <laughs> and he goes, Dad, you know what? Now that you're not working, do you ever worry that everyone's going to forget about you, that you'll never be able to write another book, go on television, get another speaking engagement, or ever make money again? <laughs> <laughs> Kids I was, that have this wisdom. I was, and literally, of course, those were all my worries. They had just <laughs> gone away. Fears, right? And I was just like, thank you for voicing every single scare that I had. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, actually, I do have those fears sometimes, but I think it'll be okay. And, and the interesting thing is, as I came back and started doing all this stuff, my son also saw that lesson. He was like, wow, you know, you just stepped right back in, and now you're doing more. So Health. Health. Wow. Well, before we break, I, I want to say... For those of you who are watching live, wherever you are on the planet, uh, we're going to take an hour break, 45 minutes, call it 50 minutes. Because I went over. That's right. <laughs> no, no, but, but we also got to get some food. So wherever you are, uh, go out and get a snack and then come back for the master class that you're about to uh, deploy and host. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. You're so Big welcome. creative live round of applause for yeah. David. Thank you. Thank you guys for all being here. Thank you, buddy.